Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to this session, building a co-lingual website, lessons learned from Ireland.ie. So my name is Alan Burke, uh, one of the directors at Anartec, we're Ireland's uh, leading Drupal development company. Um, this is a project we worked with the Department of the Arts, Heritage and the Gaeltic here in Ireland uh, to build a website commemorating the 1916 Rising. So 2016 is a big year for Ireland uh, in that we were commemorating, not celebrating, commemorating uh, the 1916 Rising. And you'll, if you've been here for even more than a couple of days, you'll spot different uh, events being promoted, um, different uh, physical reminders. Is that crackling a bit much? Okay, we'll keep going. Um, so yeah, so we've worked with on this side for about the last 18 months or so. It's still an ongoing development as the, the nature of the commemoration changes. So we'll speak about uh, what we learned about the co-lingual aspect of the website um, during this talk. Um, obviously, English is my first language and I speak rather fast. If at any point I'm speaking too fast or you'd like me to repeat anything at all, please raise your hand and shout me down. Uh, no problem whatsoever. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. However, if you would like some clarification on some aspect during the presentation, that's just fine as well. So what's very important for this uh, presentation is, is context. And I'm going to probably spend a bit more talking about context than I possibly would for other presentations, because a lot of the things you'll see later on, um, questions will pop into your head as, why did they do things like that? Uh, it doesn't seem like a simple way to do things, or it seems overly complex. Well, I want to talk a little bit about 1916 and why it's a big deal at all in this country. So basically, um, this is not intended to be an accurate historical lecture. It is not my intention to mislead, misinform, or offend anyone in the room of any tradition um, in, in any way, shape, or form. So let, let's just keep that in mind before he starts shouting me down with historical inaccuracies. So basically, Ar Ireland has been uh, afflicted by uh, foreign occupations for a long time. Um, depends how far back you want to you go, but basically, we all started out here as... Uh, someone from another country. So in the, in my own heritage would be a Norman heritage, so I can't even claim to be native Irish myself. Um, but basically, um, as soon as there were occupations and invasions, there was also um, rebellions and attempts by the native Irish, uh, in whatever shape that would appear to be, to uh, fight back against uh, foreign occupations. So there's been, there have been rebellions. Um, I did a little bit of research on this, and there's been rebellions for, you know, as soon as there's been occupation, there's been rebellion. But there's been big ones, as in famously recalled and historically documented from as far back as 1534, 1641, and then for definitely well-known dates in Irish history would be 1798 and 1916 itself. And, and, in, and indeed, and depending who you speak to, there's still ongoing um, rebellion in, in certain parts of the country. But we're not going to get into that today uh, as much as uh, w maybe we could. Um, and, and an important aspect about the 1916 rebellion itself is that it wasn't actually particularly successful in and of itself. So it's something that's slightly glossed over in the history of the whole thing is that it didn't really do what it set out to do in the first place. So, you know, uh, for a start, it didn't achieve anything at all immediately. Um, the rebellion leaders were forced to surrender. Um, they didn't really gain any uh, concessions or territory or anything like that that you might expect to gain from a rebellion. However, what made 1916 successful was the reaction by the, um, I guess, the, uh, the British authorities to the leaders of the rebellion. So despite the fact that it didn't really have an awful lot of public support by the people at the time uh, on the streets, uh, the uh, leaders of the 1916 uh, uh, rebellion were, were in many cases executed. Um, and indeed, you can go down to Kilmainham Jail and, and see the scenes of those things. And it was actually the public reaction to that that laid, led to an increased Irish nationalism in various hues that eventually led to Irish independence in 1921. So it's with a, a bit of rose-tinted glasses that a lot of people look back at 1916 and, and think that it was a very successful, uh, it did a great job. Uh, and it did, but it really it was only the, rea the, the uh, reactions to it that helped it become a success. Um, but that said, it's... it's uh, it's uh, famously recalled and you know, historically important within Ireland. So when, the, when talk of the 1916 commemoration came around maybe two, three years ago, it, it, was, it was unsure as to how it would be re received within Ireland. You know, uh, sometimes these things will depend on the popularity of the government of the day and things like that. So the Irish government were unsure as to how exactly to treat this. So eventually the decision was to take and to treat it as a commemoration, not a celebration. And uh, the Irish public took relatively well to the co this concept 
and there's been a, a good groundswell of support in terms of uh, locally organized activities and activity organized by lots of different organizations. So um, the purpose of the 1916 project itself and the website that we delivered was more or less to act, or at least initially, was more or less to act as a portal to other events that are going to take place throughout the country. Um, and th that context is kind of important too. It, it was initially envisaged this might not be a content-heavy website. This would be very much a, a presentation, a brochure-style website that wouldn't be really deep on content, but we would point out to external partners who would be running the events who would have you know, greater in-depth historical treatment of the various things that people would like to talk about. So this was the original intention of the entire project as a whole, but also of the website as a reflection of that. So again, uh, the next slide, yeah, here we go. So I want to talk about Irish. So that's uh, the Irish word for Irish, Gaelga. So, you know, Ireland and Irish, uh, you know, th there's obviously a long history there. It's been, it was the native language, obviously, for quite a long time, but really suffered in terms of its, I guess, popularity and usage in the, in the late 17th century and 18th century. Uh, and the, the big event in Ireland that really um, almost completely destroyed the Irish language was the, the Great Famine of the mid 19th century. So um, Irish was seen as very much a, a backward language, a, a peasant language. The English was the administrative language. And if you wanted to get anywhere ahead in life, you really had to learn to use English or, or be damned to a, to a life without any, uh, you, you couldn't represent yourself publicly or anything like that. And then on top of that, you had a situation whereby um, Irish was actively forced out by the official authorities at the time. As a language itself, it's not, a, it's not like English, it's a, it's a, a Celtic language. Uh, closest relatives would be languages like Scots Gaelic, Welsh, and uh, Manx, which is the language on the Irish Man, uh, on the Isle of Man, uh, Cornish, and uh, Breton in, in northern France. So it, it is it is itself quite different to English, and obviously, you know, as languages go, they they have loan words from other languages and that kind of stuff. Um, as an Irish public, we're all expected you know, you have to learn Irish in school, uh, up as far as uh, your your final uh, secondary school exams, but it's a bizarre thing that most people leave school without really being able to speak or hold a conversation in Irish. It's taught as a subject and we're all imposed or inflicted with uh, various artifacts of Irish uh, old uh, poetry and, uh, and novels. And uh, not, not a lot of people leave school with the, with the love of the language. But some people do and those people are very, very, very passionate about the language. And that will become very relevant to this website itself. Now of course, alongside that there are people who use, still use Irish as their, as their first daily language. And that's predominantly on the West Coast and, and various other pockets around the country where it's the first uh, language of everybody and it's used by everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not dead, but it's definitely not the lingua franca. So, and you'd struggle if you walked around Dublin today and tried to get service uh, through Irish in, in various facilities. And uh, if, if you want to laugh, you can have a look at a film called You Ming as Alam Dum. Um, it's a little short film on YouTube about a, a guy who decides to emigrate to Ireland, finds out the official language is Ireland, learns Irish, arrives in Dublin and realizes that nobody speaks it. So uh, I encourage you to have a look at that one. So I talked a little bit about Irish itself and, and why it's important on this site. So this is a screenshot of a, uh, a news item on the Irish National Publisher, RTE, and it's uh, November 2014. So this website has been through a few iterations and we haven't been involved in them all. But one iteration, and this was very much a, a very early iteration of the, of the website. It wasn't even on the Ireland.ie domain name at the time. So the, the process that happened there was pretty typical for a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of website projects. The developers who worked on the website um, didn't speak Irish themselves and weren't in a position to translate it. So they put, used Google Translate just as placeholder text so they could you know, finish off the website while the translations were going to be delivered by an external agency. Unfortunately, they went live with some Google Translate text. Not a whole pile of it. You know, it wasn't like the entire thing was done in really poor Irish. There were certain little sections. But there was absolute furore over this by certain sections of people who have a vested interest in 1916 itself. So what we found as we worked on this project is that we have a lot, we had a lot of stakeholders to deal with in this project. In every project, you know, you have your client and they generally can tell you how things should be done and how things will be done. And they'll, you know, give you yes or no answers to how things they'd like to get done. But the reality is in this project, we had a lot more people to deal with. Oh, and one, if, you, if we saw the full um, text of this, you'll see that one of the, the, the pe people who were complaining about this most loudly were representatives of the relatives of the people who died in 1916. So slightly unusually, in a, in at least in an international context, the relatives of the people who were executed in 1916 have this special place within the 1916 commemoration. And their views hold a lot of sway as to how things should be done. 
So as well as having to deal with sort of general members of the public and perhaps uh, historians in an ap academic context, uh, local authorities, arts organisations who were going to be actually putting on events to commemorate this. this. This group of relatives had to be catered to at every stage of the journey. So while we would suggest things should be done in a certain way, this wasn't always going to fly with an organisation like that. And obviously, like the things I talked about here, this entire project was a very politically sensitive topic. And discussions and decisions were often on a political level as to who, what we could do that wouldn't offend anyone more than what might be the best thing to do. And uh, you know, this, this obviously provided challenges, but um, this, this gave us an indication when we started getting involved. We, we'd known about this. This was obviously big news in, in, in Ireland. And we knew that whenever we started to get involved, we'd have to get translations right, or at least we couldn't just think about it as an afterthought. We had to say, OK, how are we going to deal with the translation issue at the very start? So again, I guess it's slightly a bit more context. Like, How do people normally handle multilingual implementation? So I've used the word traditional because this is as much as you can say about tradition for a platform that's only been around for 20 years. So there's a couple of different ways you can decide to, to approach language presentation. So the first one is a very simple language switcher up there in the, in the top right-hand corner. So you develop your site. It's available at different uh, URL paths. And the URL path will help you, will, will decide the, the presentation of the site in different languages. So it's a very sim uh, simple switcher. You click on the language that you want on whatever page you're on. It will present that language to you, uh, sorry, present that content to you in that language. So you can do it like that, where you've just got two languages, or if things get a bit more complex, you can present a language switcher, which I think at the last count it was uh, almost 20 languages there on, on, on a site that we worked on. And again, uh, this site um, was slightly unusual in the, for, a, for all the languages. It was extremely important that the, the, language, the site would only be available in that language. So we couldn't have any fallback to English. And fallback to English is going to become relevant when we talk about some of the aspects of this website as well. But this was a, for, for the customer experience on this website, it was extremely important that they would not accidentally see a string of English. So often, we're used to working on websites where we see translations. And if there's a couple of strings of English on it, and you say German's your first language, you're not going to be overly offended or put off by maybe a slight headline or some footer text in, a, in another language. As long as you can get through the content that you require in your own language, you'll be happy enough. But this, that was a definite no-no on this site. And we'll talk about what we could and could not get away with on the Ireland.ie site. So another way you can off augment language uh, choice is by the use of flags. So this is a uh, local authority website here in Ireland, uh, not developed by Anertech. But uh, the, the developers have chosen to use flags to represent the choice of language. Now, flags, at the best of times, are problematic in terms of how you would choose to represent uh, a language. So it's especially problematic in Ireland that uh, the Union Jack, the, the flag of the United Kingdom, is used to represent English, despite the fact that within the context of Ireland, I speak English, but I'm not from the United Kingdom. Similarly, despite the fact that I might see myself as Irish, Irish, the Irish language wouldn't necessarily be the first language I'd choose to, to browse a website. I, I, I speak it relatively fluently, but if, the, if it's available in English, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in English. Um, so this, this is a problem, you know, I, I think a lot of people who build websites who, you know, haven't been, haven't been exposed to the problems of, of flags uh, used as a, as a language switcher. This is a good example, and I, I, I'm really surprised that it's still there. Uh, but, you know, you couldn't build a website for the Swiss uh, market by using the, the flags of France, Germany, Italy, and uh, the Romance region to represent the choice of languages on the, uh, on the site. So I think that's something that people say, oh, I want a flag chooser. Uh, it isn't the way to go, and certainly not for a site in this context. And another way to do it is to let the browser decide. So what we have here is these are the HTTP headers that the browser sent in a request to the server. So what I've changed my settings uh, on, on Chromium, as that happens, to say my first language is German. And uh, if you've got your content available in German, send it to me in German. So the, the website responds, sending the content in as much translation as got available in German. It's not quite a full translation. Um, they could have done a bit more with the, the cookie message. Um, I especially like the translation of this site uses cookies has been translated to I would like some cookies. <laughs> um, but, 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 non but nonetheless, the, the, the most important parts of the, of the site are available in German. And I can navigate the site and use the site in the language that I have chosen in my browser. This is all done before I ever visit the site at all. 
The browser says to the server, hey, I want German. The server says, great, here, have some German. But what's interesting about all these are they're all, they're all uh, single choices. So we, in, in every single instance we looked at so far, it said, send me one language and one language only. Um, I can read others in this case, but I really only want to see one language at a time. So, you know, in our head, that's how we thought we'd look at this website, that we'd do it with one language at a time. And, you know, we've done like, some examples there. We've done plenty of websites where we've done one language at a time, and that's fine. We know how to solve that problem. However, given the furore over the treatment of Irish in initial iteration of the website, and certain other interest groups seeing Irish as being very important for this particular commemoration, a decision was taken at a project level, not just at a website level, at a project level, to, as much as possible, treat Irish as it is treated in the Irish constitution. So Irish is the first official language of Ireland, and English is the second official language. And you have a right as a citizen to have every single service available to you in Irish. So the, the website was seen as, well, you know, we're talking about the constitution, now that's not a constitutional thing, but if, uh, not the constitution, the proclamation was an important document as part of the 1916 Rising, and it talked about equality and things like that as well. So it was decided that we should try and embrace that as much as possible and make sure that everything, every, every piece of material about this uh, commemoration was available in both languages and both languages fully. So how are we going to do that? So what we did was we looked at a couple of different approaches. Um, again, I talked about the context of where this website was seen as, as essentially just a brochureware website. It wouldn't have a whole pile of content. It would be something that would be seen as, as a portal to point people to different websites where more information about historical events, more information about current events and commemorations, more events about permanent reminders or permanent exhibitions that were going to be part of this. So it wasn't seen to be this really, really content deep site. That was the initial, I guess, brief or how we envisaged the site would, would play out at the start. Now that did evolve over time, but I want to look at how we treated uh, the different languages as we, as we uh, presented them on the site. So some of it was fairly straightforward. We took uh, both languages and placed them one on top of the other. Uh, different colors used uh, in, in most cases to represent the different languages. And uh, you know, that, that, that looks pretty good. It's not going to scale beyond you know, two languages, really. It'll just about scale to two, to be, to be honest. Uh, a certain amount of iconography used, which I know is going to have some sort of accessibility potential issues uh, to represent things, rather than sticking with just um, a single language there. So, uh, so that's basically one language on top of another. Uh, the logo very carefully left out any words at all, just stuck with numbers. Uh, um, yeah, so this more examples of uh, another sort of item of content with uh, you know, English on top and Irish on the bottom. So with obviously other pieces of content, <coughs> longer pieces of text where we went for side by side. Uh, and again, obviously, for those who ask, well, you know, how are you going to do that on mobile? Well, you had to be pragmatic and put one language on top on a mobile device. So if you look at that particular page on a mobile device, it'll represent the languages top to bottom. And we've got enough screen width, and we use the, the two-column approach. And then we have uh, some more top to bottom. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, the one to, what I wanted to do here is this is actually a slow little video. Uh, I don't know if that's visible to everyone. You should see the mouse moving in. And on the hover, we get the Irish version of the, of the little bit of a microcopy there. So that that seems okay. We were like, okay, that's one way to treat the, you know, have both languages available on the site. Initially, we had it reversed. It was Irish first and then English on top, but that got changed. And then that grew legs. And we started having a scenario where we had a lot of content in English with the Irish content revealed in the hover state. So this wasn't, we weren't overly happy with this. We didn't feel that this stuck entirely true to the notion of treating both languages equally. You know, if you look at the site and you don't, uh, you don't interact with it using a hover state, you don't get to see the Irish. And obviously that problem uh, exists on a mobile device as well. So the other problem, at, at least it doesn't animate by itself. So you choose when to move the mouse, so you're not going to have a situation where you're halfway through reading something and the animation kicks in and it drives away. So I think that was one suggestion that we knocked back. But So we did this and we, we thought we'd do it for a, a small number of elements, and it, it's got its problems. We're not overly happy with it, uh, but it's there, and it, it looks nice, if nothing else, and that's always important. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we had, and the first one is this, assumptions of content length. So the idea behind this website, and indeed the project was, that we never, th I, and I can't say this often enough, we never thought we'd have an awful lot of content. So again, if you don't have too much content, you're going to have the time, and you can get the resources in to craft content length to match. 
So that when you present the both languages together, they won't look radically different. And this, this makes sense whereby you, you only see yourself as a placeholder and that most of the ongoing content updates are going to happen elsewhere. So you're not going to be under time pressure to get content length right and craft content to fit in the spaces available. Now, you could argue that maybe a different design decision should have been chosen to, to do these things. But again, we, you know, it was felt that, no, this is all manageable. We're going to have the time to craft these things and get the lengths right. But of course, the project itself, I think the 1916 commemoration itself, definitely grew in, in public popularity. There was more resources available to put on a lot more events. And suddenly, this website had an awful lot more content that was ever envisaged. If you look at the original brochure that was put together to commemorate this event, it's a hell of a lot lighter and smaller than what, what the content is on the website now. Um, so you know, this is a good thing. We're obviously doing a good job with the website. Um, a lot of people are using it. A lot of the different partners who are putting on events always want to make sure that their content was promoted on this website as well. So you know, sometimes it works really well. We can sit down and we can write really nice phrases and it looks you know, equally presented on the website. And sometimes it doesn't. So different events have nice, long titles. And other ones even longer here. The problem is that in order to fit that within the design, we had to go for a, a strategy of content uh, management called truncation. And uh, I think Cara McGrain says that truncation is not a content strategy. So this was the best that we could do, given the time that we had available. You know, Have a complete re rework of the design wasn't going to be an option. But so this was the approach that we took. So this, this isn't really doing the job of presenting both languages together uh, in, in an equal sense. So this is an issue. I mean, the only way to solve it would be to go back to your, to your drawing board design-wise and come up with a different way to present these things. Um, because the, the, the volume of content had reached the point where we weren't going to be able to you know, roll the clock back and say, oh, no, no, we're going to spend time reworking the, uh, the titles on all these elements here. That's just not going to be an option. Uh, another problem we had was keeping translations timely. So a lot of events were put together and uh, English content was made available, sorry, made available to the, uh, the website publishers or the various editors on the website. However, the keeping, again, this is with the volume, increased more volume than we'd expected and therefore keeping translations timely proved especially difficult. So what that meant was a very, very undesirable scenario whereby we have placeholder text, whereby the, the, that line basically translates as the Irish text is coming. Um, yeah, not ideal, but you know, sometimes you have to be pragmatic and go, is it better to put up something or is it better to put up nothing? And the decision was taken, we better put something up there because otherwise it's not there at all. And you know, this, this definitely was not, is not well received by people who, who would like to see the Irish language treated in an equal manner, because it's evidently not been treated in an equal manner here. But look, th this is the, where the real world meets decisions that are taken without having real world content. And in this case, I was probably a bit more sympathetic than I would normally be to a client, because a lot of this stuff you just couldn't envisage. No one really knew exactly how this thing would play out. In a lot of contexts, people can tell you, if, you know, honest answers as to how the availability of translation resources within an organization, and you can make decisions based on that. This was a bit more where they genuinely didn't know how things were going to play out, and this kind of stuff wasn't envisaged. So I'm going to uh, cut the client some slack there. Another problem we had then arose as, again, to do with the volume, we had to do with external translations. So again, it was always envisaged that the translators would work in-house within the Department of the Arts, Heritage, and the Gilthic, and they would have no problem keeping translations up to date. But the volume went way beyond that. The resources weren't available internally, so we had to come up with a way to deal with external translations. Now, I'll talk about some of the things, the decisions we made and, and what we got wrong, but in terms of how we had to deal with external translations, some of the de development decisions meant that at a short notice, our only approach was to write a, a custom XML export and make that available to the translation uh, organization who would then work on it and provide an XML export that we could, could pull back into the website. So it worked very well from a technology perspective. Uh, we could get translations updated on the website uh, using that resource. They didn't have to deal with in-house resources to get them up to date. Um, however, it, it's not something that we had envisaged at the very start, and therefore the experience isn't ideal, neither from a developer experience in terms of producing that work, or even from a workflow from a publisher. It's, it's definitely suboptimal, but you have to come up with solutions to match the deadlines that you're given.
Okay, so we did a bit of work on the editorial experience. Again, um, we wanted the uh, editors to be able to use this site and uh, add the content in both languages in, in, a, in a visually equ equivalent way, for, for want of a better phrase. So we, we sat down and thought, okay, how can we do this? Um, so we had a look at Drupal side-by-side -side translation uh, modules, and we couldn't really get anything to fit in with the stuff that we were working with. So in the end, we actually went back to basics, and we have a very simple implementation whereby we have different fields available which describe the different language options available. So this wouldn't be, I suppose, the most um, developer pure implementation of a multilingual approach. However, from an editor perspective, they were delighted. They were like, OK, great. I can put in the Irish, I can put in the English. I, ha I can get an idea of how long the piece of text is beside each other so that when we talked about crafting content to match it, this approach worked really, really well. So they were able to go, OK, fine. I can see that the titles are roughly equivalent. Um, you, you, you're not going to see it in the screenshot, but we have um, little bits of JavaScript that tell them how far or how many, how many uh, characters of text they've got put in. We couldn't enforce uh, a strict content length as much as we'd want to, but what we could do is give them warnings that they were going beyond the recommended content length. So, in, you know, I mean, at least then they were aware that they were putting in stuff that was just a bit too big for the various uh, presentations that would have on the website. So the things like this short description was used in, in various parts of the website where we used different types of teasers and listings views to present this stuff. So this, this worked quite well. This meant that the editors were able to get the content in, put Irish and English in at the same time, keep it roughly equivalent from a from a length perspective, so that at a visual perspective, it looked roughly equivalent. And, and, uh, and sorry, to, to continue on that is the problem with, I suppose, Drupal's traditional multilingual approach is that you create the different language additions or versions independently, and therefore you don't always get to see the two languages side by side and know that they're roughly visually equivalent. Now, of course, within the context of the modern web, you shouldn't be worried about that at all. You should be just worried about your content because you just don't know where your content is going to be presented. But nonetheless, this is something that was required for this website. So this is another example of it further down. Uh, you know, we've got uh, two WYSIWYG editors. Tough to squeeze them onto the screen there, but we did our best. Uh, so they can keep adding on this content uh, for various sections of the website. Um, another, another big success we had for this website was structured content. So this was, if not our very first paragraph uh, module implementation. Oh, sorry, to give you a backstory, the site is built in Drupal 7, and I'll talk about Drupal 8 in a second. Um, but this was one of our very first uh, approaches of using um, the paragraphs module. So previously, we'd been uh, heavy proponents of field collections. But what we found with our uh, is field collections? Yeah, field collections module. So what we found with field collections was it was a bit limiting in that it was a very predefined approach to what you could have in a single field collection. And mixing and matching different types of field collections wasn't really doable. So as soon as Paragraphs module came along, um, we had exhausted how far we could get with field collections already. And the Paragraphs module really, really uh, suited our approach to building websites. And we were one of, one of, uh, we, this is one of the first websites that we used building it. So th this was something that worked really well as well. Because a lot of the sites, a lot of the pages on the website will have varying amounts of content. So we had to come up with a design approach that would deal with something as simple as, we've only got a headline. Um, that's all we've got. But it's got to look good on the site. Or we've got 10 pages of text, and we have to make sure it looks good on the site. So rather than having predefined fields, what we did was we came up with a, a number of different paragraph components. And again, each of these paragraph components will have different uh, fields to capture the various uh, language requirements. So even something like uh, in the, the image captions, we had to make sure that Irish was available as well. Um, for um, alt uh, attributes and for hover states. Um, various text components are going to have, obviously, Irish and English available side by side as well. So the way that gets presented then on the front end is in a relatively straightforward uh, top to bottom approach, we present the different elements uh, as paragraph components and they get laid out on the page one after another. So this worked really well. It let the editors keep adding stuff to pages that they weren't constrained by just a couple of Drupal fields. We over the course of the project, we added a couple of different paragraph components, and then they were available for different projects of the website. So we've become very big uh, paragraph components and use it in all our projects. It's a key building tool for all of our sites, multilingual or not. Uh, Views was another tool that we used heavily as well. So we've got a couple of examples of this. I'm not going to get into it too much, uh, because it isn't necessarily relevant to the dual language approach. But uh, one of the things was we extended the, and this is obviously not very visually pretty, but 
uh, as the volume of content exploded, we needed a way to get all of the data and present it and search it and store and, and do content updates to it. Um, events were very, uh, I, I, I wish I could talk about this a bit more, but events were a particular challenge on this website because in my head, the definition of event is something that happens at a time, at a place, and it's hosted by somebody. You know, it's, that's fairly common. You'd expect that to be mandatory fields for events. We had events without dates, without locations, without hosts. But we knew they were going to happen. So therefore, they were an event. So we, ha like, you know, th this, this proved extremely challenging. And then, you know, we were told, oh, no, we won't, you know, you don't need to worry about start dates and end dates. We'll just, you know, tell people what month it's on. Because we're just a placeholder website. They'll be going to the other websites to find out exact dates, start dates, duration, repeating, all that kind of stuff. And of course, as the content grew, the requirements grew. And that's fine. We're flexible developers. We'll deal with whatever's thrown wha at us. But it, it, definitely, um, it definitely was a challenge to, to have an event listing without a date. Because how do you order it if you can't order it by date? But yet we knew more or less when these events were going to happen. So we had to come up with approaches for that. But that's a talk for another day. Um, so this is, again, Views presentation. So uh, this, this was used heavily throughout the site. Um, we use views to present listings of sites and um, listings and related content. We use views heavily for that. Um, also used entity field query to do some generate some custom listings as well. Now, I'll talk about what I'd like to have done differently. So hindsight is, of course, everything. Um, every project you finish, you always think, oh, well, if only. So the first thing I'd done is uh, either would have waited a year to celebrate in 1916 and used Drupal 8. Um, but obviously not a particularly viable approach. Um, you know, the multilingual handling within Drupal 8 is significantly better than Drupal 7 out of the box and even significantly better with Drupal 7 and all the various multilingual sites or multilingual um, modules. So one, one of the sites you saw there was Sacred Space, that's a Drupal 7 implementation. Um, it's, we had it on multilingual in Drupal 6 before that and suffice us to say when the day comes to port that to Drupal 8, it'll be a hell of a lot easier than it ever was in any of the, the previous two platforms. Um, we look forward to using Drupal 8 for more and more multilingual sites. It'll definitely be a hell of a lot easier. Um, but I'm sure we'll find more problems. So the other, and another thing we would have done is we would have stuck to our guns and used Drupal multilingual approach properly. So rather than going for the different fields that you have that present the different content, so you have an Irish field and an English field, we would have said, right, you have an English uh, source content and an Irish translation. And we would have done whatever it took in terms of a customer, a custom editor experience to present an editorial experience that presented both language fields side by side, but yet were stored by Drupal in Drupal standard way. That came back to bite us in a number of different ways, things like revisions, updates of translations, when was the Irish updated as opposed to the English updated. Um, dealing with the external translators was obviously a problem because the standard Drupal tools that we used to make translations available weren't available to us because of the approach we'd taken. Um, we did look at refactoring to do that, but you know, we sort of looked at the different approaches. Can we write a custom export to, to solve that problem or do we need to do a rework? And the custom export was, was vastly quicker. Um, you know, maybe when all you've got is a hammer, uh, you, you, you just keep doing that. So we, we were able to write a custom XML export without, without a greatly difficult challenge. I mean, it wasn't trivial, but it was definitely easier than a full rework of the site. Um, obviously, you've seen that some of the design elements don't work very well when the content length has changed. And we, there was a good bit of, of back and forth with the client on that, and we expressed you know, concerns we had over mobile representation, accessibility, and content length. And I think on a few of them, now that we see a lot more content in there, maybe we would have done pushback a bit more. Again, hindsight is everything. We could have pulled up a lot more examples when we see the final content and go, hey, look, this doesn't really fly here. You've got like a, a title that's you know, 30, 40 words long. That's not going to work in various aspects of the site, even if it was just one language, much less if it was done in two languages. Um, the other thing is, and I really, uh, I haven't got along to the talks on it this week, but we, this site is ripe for content staging. There was an awful lot of content that was just not available in both languages, and we would like to have waited until both translations are available, fully approved, and then push that content as an addition of the website uh, and push it live. So content staging would have been extremely useful for this site. It, it's, it's one of those things, as soon as you, you hear about it and, and you read into it and you go, actually, yeah, we've got an awful lot of sites where that would have been an extremely useful tool. And this is the one that, you know, I, w I wish we had the, the, the time, I guess, to, to, to look at it a bit closely, more closely in Drupal 7, and definitely we'll be looking at it for a lot of our projects in Drupal 8 where that kind of stuff happens, whereby people want to publish 30 pages simultaneously, 
and remove 20 other pages simultaneously and do things like that. So definitely content staging is something we're going to be looking into a lot closer for our future projects. Um, so that, that covers it in terms of the presentation. We've got plenty of time for questions, but I've got a couple of other slides. Uh, first is to enjoy everyone, enjoy, uh, invite everyone along to the contribution sprints on Friday. So there is something there for everyone, regardless of your skill set or level uh, with Drupal. You're going to have plenty of stuff that you can learn about. Uh, I didn't manage to update the slide to say to invite everyone along to Trivia Night on Thursday night. Uh, I'll be the MC on Thursday night. It'll be a lot of fun. I'll be not quite as polite as I am today. And uh, it'll be good fun. If you haven't been to DrupalCon, it's definitely worth attending. It's, a, it's an eye-opening experience. I hope you have a lot of fun. Uh, secondly, we need to know what you thought of this. So go to the Drupal.org events website, uh, evaluate this session, let us know what you thought. I'm happy to hear uh, feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, after the talk as well. Let us know what you thought. Um, please do that, because that, that's going to decide you know, the kind of talks that people will use for future, uh, will like to see at future uh, Drupal events. So that, that is quite important. Even a couple of minutes definitely helps a lot. So lastly, lastly, I'd like to thank you all. So middle week is, I guess, yeah, time for questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, if you just uh, make your way up to the mic so we get it recorded, or else I'll get in trouble from the room monitor. I presume the mic is working, Martin. Don't be shy. Working. Mm -hmm. there. Did you get any pushback about the fact that you've got difference in contrast between the colours that you've used for English and for Irish? Absolutely. So the colour scheme was driven by the printed brochure to a large degree. We didn't get an awful lot of variance on that, uh, not as much as we would have liked. Uh, but yeah, there is definitely an issue with that. It's not ideal. I've seen worse. I've done worse. But it isn't ideal. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other little things there in terms of accessibility I'm not overly happy with. Even like browsing, in particular the hover stuff to reveal the other content, it's not ideal. Um, we, we've done our best. There's a bit more we could have done. I mean, look, there's always more you can do. But there was a few that you know, were there on, in the back of my head, hey, I must get down and do things like mark different sections of text with different language attributes. Now, I'm not sure what difference that would make entirely from an accessibility perspective, but from an SEO perspective, it definitely would have helped. Now, you know, and we okay, SEO is important for every website, but it wasn't a key key thing for this. We had enough problems with various stakeholders we had to keep happy and things like that. But yeah, there was a few little things like that I would have liked to have done. Um, we pushed back on plenty. There could have been a lot scarier stuff up there from an access accessibility expert or, uh, perspective. Let me put it that way. And you've said you've said how happy you were and what you wish you'd done differently. How how was the client? Were they s yeah, this was fine, or have they loved it, or? Oh, they've been. Oh, well, I think they've been very happy. Uh, they pay their bills. Um, <laughs> ah, no, they have. Yeah, like we're still doing work on the site, still doing uh, additions and changes to various things. It's nominated for an award tonight, the Irish Web Awards. So we'll see what various other independent people think of it. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I really liked how you uh, took the uh, perspective of the content editor into consideration. Um, but actually, my question was, um, yeah, do you have like for accessibility reason um, every content that is in English and Irish uh, marked as language differently? And so have you even tried with a, um, a, a, a speech, uh, thank you, screen reader uh, to l read the site out? No. So uh, I would have loved to spend a lot more time on that. Like uh, as you're some of you are aware, Drupal's core accessibility maintainer works for Anertech. I would have loved to get them in there. Not, like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I know that we should have done better, but sometimes proving it and, and giving real world examples of it. So Andrew can definitely do some stuff in terms of presenting and driving home to the client, hey, look, here's where it works really badly. Um, <coughs> the stuff that we were, we, you know, we did, at least everything's in text. And that was a bit of a challenge because some of the printed material had very stylized versions and uh, infographic style representations of stuff. So we got away from that and kept it with just text, so at least it could be you know, read and, and consumed by various different devices and search engines and things like that. Um, language attributes, I wish I'd been able to spend a bit more time on those, but funnily enough, that would have been a bit easier. Well, actually, no, it's, it's not that it's particularly hard, but it just took a while to get it just right, and uh, you know, time, budget, materials, etc. Uh, but yeah, we, we were aware of that, and we, 
it, it's not as bad as it could have been, but it definitely could be better. But I, I think that could be true of a lot of sites. Uh, sorry, I haven't been to the beginning, but uh, are there any uh, limitations or regulations you, you should have, uh, you needed to adhere uh, from the government? For, uh, for yeah. So there are, in theory, yes, in practice, no. So there are there is legislation in terms of accessibility and that kind of stuff. I've yet to hear of anybody who, uh, certainly in a, in, a, in a government perspective, where it's seen as, oh, no, no, we really care about this over everything else. Or this is a given, and if it means we can't do X, Y, or Z, that's just fine. I wish it were so. It would make my life a lot easier because I prefer to develop like that. But no. Uh, it, it, you know, it's one of these things you see on, on requests for tenders, and then you come in and go, oh, well, we could do that, but that's a bit tricky from an accessibility perspective. Oh, well, well then we'll, that doesn't care. You know, we want to do it this way, you know? And like, I mean, look, I'm sure it's, it's the same in every project, not just in a government perspective. And you do, you, you know, I guess every project is a, is, is a bit of give and take. So you do as much as you can, so it isn't, you know, you, you get as much accessibility in, so to speak, as, as you can, or try not to do something heinous with a website. And that's our approach to all these websites. Just do as much as you can, but sometimes you can't do everything. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks for the presentation first. And did you have um, any problem with search engine optimization with two languages? Uh, no, because it's not that we didn't care, but it definitely wasn't a top priority of this project. Um, we were aware of things that we could tweak to make things better if we needed to, but it, because it never arose as being a priority, there was time and money spent on other things. Um, it, it was one of the things I was kind of hoping it would happen because I was looking forward to solving those problems, but it didn't arise as being a big issue, uh, at least yet. Uh, like we're currently in discussions with them as to what we do with this website now. So the Ireland.ie domain name is not owned by the Department of Arts, Heritage and Guilt. It's actually owned by either the Tourism Authority or the Industrial Development Authority. Fault, yeah, the Tourism Authority owns the domain name and they've sort of loaned it back to the Department of Arts, Heritage and Guilty for this, for this year. So what we're trying to work out is what's the appropriate representation for this content in the future? Like, do we just make an archive of it and just leave it there or do we do something different? Do we cull it back to the appropriate content um, you know, as a snapshot, and as a as a historical record of what happened or, or what. So when all that's done, I think that's at a point where you'll have to think about S uh, search engine optimization a bit more than we might have done for this. This is very fluid and people knew to go here. You know, we weren't overly concerned about getting stuff on top of search engines for, for everything here. It's important to remember that a lot of the content here, you know, while it is represented on this website, is represented on other websites as well. Um, so, for example, a lot, of the a lot of the events were presented by different arts organizations, cultural organizations, or local authorities. So they also had their content up there as well. And we kind of have a, you know, like I said, it's a political exercise here. So if our event is listed higher than theirs on a search engine thing, that probably wouldn't go down well either. So, you know, I, I, you'd, you'd have political issues to navigate there as well as technical issues. And, and a lot of little political issues, just like that, it seems facetious, it seems outrageous, but yeah, we had to deal with little, little political problems like that as well. Yeah. Answer, answer accepted. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I was wondering if you got any experience of making an already mature website co-lingual, because I think that's what's going to happen to remanage a large um, public sector website. It looks like over the next few years it's going to have to become co-lingual. I would fight tooth and nail to you avoid a co-lingual <laughs> approach. Yeah. It's just not practical. Like. Again, the context was that this was only ever meant to be seen as a, as a visual thing, as a, as a nice to look at thing, but not very deep or heavy. It was always going to point to other websites. So within that context, we sort of said, okay, fine, the coding thing, we, we can go with that. But as soon as you start getting into volumes of content, like m the way I look at it is, like I, I speak a couple of languages at, at various levels of, um, uh, but I'd never choose to have them both side by side and read them both. Yeah. I mean, I certainly wouldn't do that. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and I haven't done any research or looked for research to say, yes, people do that. If they speak a language as a second language, they like to have that available, and then also have the English as the source content. Um, like, if you use Google Translate, for example, they'll translate it, and then you can hover over to see the source language and things like that. I don't know, maybe maybe they've done the research and thought that that works for people. Maybe that's a way to do co-lingual. Yeah, 
Yeah, our problem is, is that we have no user need for it. Absolutely none. We know this. We can prove this. Okay. So it's a political requirement. And what, are, what are the languages? Welsh. All oh, right, okay. Uh, and like, I, I guess the candidate's all available in, lang in, in Welsh using a more traditional approach to present to multiple languages. Yeah, uh, well, it could be. Again, we have no user demand, so we've never yeah. really had to do it, but it would be a statutory requirement on a, the public sector body. I, I suppose I'll go back to the EU cookie implementation as an example, <laughs> whereby I w my argument and my interpretation of the law suggests that there's no need for that pop-up, that you can fulfil the legal obligations by not having the pop-up. Now, I win that fight sometimes, and other times people go off to legal people and say, oh, no, no, you have to have a pop-up. And I don't think they're doing their work, because I really don't think there's a need for that. But somehow, people, somebody somewhere says, oh, no, you need to have a pop-up to meet that legislative requirement. Yeah. Um, and I think it could be the same for something like a multilingual approach. Like, what does the legislation really say? Does it really say side by side, or does it say something like, both languages have to be presented on an equal basis? Yeah. Well, that, to me, means that they're both available fully in that language. That's what equality really means. It isn't that they're presented visually side by side. Yeah. So that's where I'd probably go back to. So let's look at the legislative requirement here. Does it really say side by side? I really doubt it. It's yeah, going to have yeah, some yeah. phrasing that's away from that. And I'd fight tooth and nail to find a combination of legal advice to say you don't need it yeah. and, and actual user testing to say that it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, it'll work for, it'll, to be honest with you, coding will work fine, whereby you don't have significant volumes of content and it's primarily a brochure site. It'll, you know, and that's where we were starting. That was our target, I guess, at the start. Yeah. And it'll work just fine for that. Yeah, but once, <laughs> once, you, once you go beyond that, it doesn't really work. Um, and we, you know, we did our best. And you can see that you know, some things we don't like and we would, do, would have done differently. And people correctly uh, brought, brought up various issues. And like one of the things I don't like is the, is the mobile um, experience. Because you present an awful lot of content that you don't consume. And you're like, okay, the, the, the bits and the bytes won't really matter, but from a scrolling experience, it's, it's really suboptimal. And, you know, I didn't get very far when I was making those objections. I probably need to do a better job at the political side of things, maybe over the development side of things. But yeah, I, I'd go back to that. Go back to the legislation and go back to the uh, get, get better legal advice yeah. and go back <laughs> to the user testing to back that up then. Just had a thought. You discussed some of the options of other ways that you could do um, bilingual or multilingual sites. One thing you could do is that your your front page or some kind of splash page could be co-lingual. And as soon as someone's clicked on any kind of link, you say, "Oh, you clicked on the, the Welsh link or the Irish link," and then just give them the content in that language, so that you you would feel like you've entered a site and you haven't. It hasn't opted for one language over the other as a default. I mean, you could do that, but the reality is, like, even with a website like this, most people aren't going to navigate to the front page. You know, that's one entry point that might cover 10, 15 percent of use cases, depending on the websites you have. And therefore, you know, you need to look beyond that anyway. And therefore, I think you can do a much better job as a home page as it being just a splash page. Um, that would be my I don't like splash pages. They feel like a very old school approach. I will type in a URL address and I will get to the home page and I will continue my journey. Whereas the reality is this content is consumed not just at different URLs as, as landing pages, but by different devices, search engines, assistive technologies, things like that. So you really need to tackle it at a lot of different levels. Um, I look, yeah, the, the splash page, certainly the, um, the device detection one is interesting, or language detection. I think that's what we do in a lot of sites is we will present the home page as detected, but offer the choice to switch as well. So hopefully we can get it right more often than not. Or, and if we don't, then the user, the user still has the power to switch and override what the browser settings might be. Do you think people actually set their browsers up with the language settings? Well, I know at least one person who does. Yeah, I think they do. I mean, <laughs> I know I have. Like, I, I know my girlfriend speaks Irish as a first language, so she does. So any website she'll browse. And like, what you'll have there is more that Firefox and Chrome are very well localized. So she'll be able to, and, and uh, I'm not sure about the operating system, but certainly Firefox is. So she will be able to browse. And you know, I have to decipher error messages when I see them. So, okay. So that's access denied then, right, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll look at the HTTP codes before I look at the error messages and uh, work from there. But yeah, like that will send a message to the server. I think what you're more likely, less likely to have is server implementations that follow that. In other words, that actually look at the HTTP header. You're probably likely to have a lot more browsers that do it than servers that respect it. Uh, just as a point to the previous question, um, I worked for a Belgian uh, company so we, and we have three natural languages right, yeah, yeah. so we always have to do um, multilingual stuff splash pages do not work <laughs> i have to 100 percent agree because um one the it's never the entry point 
if you if you have to redirect them to that, um, yeah. it's just a lot of work that you actually don't want to do. Um, now, um, the techniques you, you end up having two home pages. You have your splash page and then your home page that's in the translated state. So, wi at well what point when someone clicks home, where are they going? So that's another problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, usually, um, a lot of companies fix it by just having different um, domain names for different languages as oh well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they, in their brochures and all communication, you can actually point them to a different URL, which splits it up a lot easier. And if they need to switch, you can always switch. I mean, it's, it's not a big problem. Um, automatically detecting languages does still tend to be a problem for us because um, well, in my case I have everything set up and most of the time things will still send me to the wrong yeah. language by default so um, yeah you, you can never rely on it it's only a hint yeah. to the browser so like uh, like on the site that we have and we do use language detection we also the user can override that obviously and choose the uh, another language and we also do language we do regional detection as well so they get d sent different content for different markets. And again, we couldn't trust that because, well, they came up with all sorts of crazy scenarios, but like, oh, well, I could be French and in London browsing the web. And like, oh, fine, we solved that use case. What's more likely is the scenario you talked about, whereby, you know, the browser just isn't behaving or they're getting an IP address from another location and things like that. Yeah, plus for us, because Belgium is a pretty small country, but we do have uh, three languages and all neighboring countries speak those languages. You'll o often have that they, um, like the, the French part of Belgium will also, I, so a company that's located there will also sell stuff or communicate to France. Oh yeah. But they'll want different content for France than they want for the French speaking Belgians. Yeah. So in that kind of situation, I mean. Yeah, so what we've learned over the years is that, that translations is only half the deal, that regionalization is the next bit. So, um, I mean, it wasn't really an issue on this site, but the other site that I show is an example where you use the language detection you know, we have a scenario whereby I think we're soon going to have at least three, if not four, different English language versions of the site uh, to deal with different markets. So scenarios I'd never thought about whereby we need to have an English language version of the website for the French market, which is going to serve different content to the UK, to the Irish, to the American version. And they're also going to be in English, but they're going to have completely different, or, uh, well, not completely different, but different content because they serve those uh, markets differently and yet they want to present the content available to those markets in multiple languages as well. So yeah, it can get yeah. pretty tricky pretty quickly. Yeah, plus uh, also uh, point to yeah, using flags. That only that, that can help if you have different regions and you have to first look at the region and, and then a language. But even then, it's, it's often also not a, a, a good idea. Um, just as a point to one of the things you mentioned. Yeah, that's right, because the languages don't work for regions. Uh, sorry, they don't work for, for languages because language boundaries and, and political boundaries don't work. They, they don't, they're not one for one, but you're right regional um, boundaries don't necessarily map to countries either. So you have a scenario whereby you talked about like the French market's a good one. So whereby you'll have a, a Belgian company serving particular services to the French market, which is different to the Belgian market. And yet the content will be in French and then another version in French. Um, we, we found that because we had like that particular site is, you know, there they split Germany by north to south. They have their own little wall they built <laughs> and uh, well I mean it's common enough like Aldi North and Sud in, in Germany as well so you know they want to present different content to different sections of, of just within one country as well uh, which you know again flags aren't going to cut it there either yeah. cool. lovely thanks very much okay we'll wrap it up there um, I'm gonna be down at our stand uh, I think it's what six zero one or whatever uh, if you go in the front door of the of the uh, hall downstairs our stand is over on the right hand side so come up and say hello if you have any other questions let us know uh, Anatech have a couple of more presentations this week and obviously we'll be there uh, heavily involved in trivia night as well so thanks very much for your time and uh, have a good Drupalcon actually uh, because um, our, our most successful multimedia site is also a volunteer based site so the sacred space site the, all their translators are volunteers and what that meant was they went over and beyond they were like volunteers tend to be very enthusiastic about what stuff they can help out with so what they found was they had translators who were only dying to help out and they've got languages that are obscure and 
don't have a huge user base, but they've got a brilliant translation because they've got one or two users who are so determined to make sure that that site was available for them. And it extended beyond language. They were able to help us with regionalization stuff as well. So we have an Arabic site, and the Arabic uh, user was able to help us with right to, left, right to left stuff. Now, they're only small little subtle things, but you know, little things like when you test in Arabic or Hebrew and you, you can't read the script, you can't even tell if it's garbled or it's whatever they were able to help us with the testing there as well. So as an organization that's based on volunteers, you're in a really good position actually, because they tend to be as good, they tend to be better translators, because they're, you know. So that's what we've done in the limited amount that we've done with, with uh, we've used, uh, I think there's four, four languages now. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and we've got uh, certain people who do it. Um, although as you know, mentioned it, that, that, that adds, you, you have to wait for the translation. And yeah, you do, yeah. And in the, in the meantime, you change the test and, and then it's out of date. And <laughs> well, the translation workflow was always interesting because every time you start, people go, okay, so there must be this one obvious way to translations in their head. And then you start talking about different workflows and possibilities and fallbacks. It's like, oh, well, we hadn't really thought about that. You know, yeah. Oh, no, no, we won't present it in other languages. If, if it isn't available in English and it's not translated, then we won't present it. Well, why don't you just present it? You know, they just Everyone has their fixed idea in their little head about, Oh yeah, that's how translations go. But it, you know, there's always there's so many different ways to handle them. You know, and, and working that out is more than half of the puzzle. So working out what the ap appropriate appropriate language translation workflow is is hard, and then the translations get a bit easier after that. Cool presentation. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks very much. Sites well, you won't for the various reasons we talked about, yeah, yeah, or you yeah, should, yeah, you know. Yeah. Like, there's, like there is, I think, that use case, limited use case whereby it makes sense, and we were there for a yeah. good while, uh, and now we've drifted a little bit away from it, and we we're hitting cool challenges. Though. It's cool in this case. It kind yeah, of I think it worked. worked I think it worked, yeah. 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 Um, notwithstanding the challenges, it worked quite well, yeah. So the, the menu is right above it. I mean, it looks, it looks elegant. See, that, that's, that's where it works quite well, because you were able to like spend time looking at the wording, looking at the number of items in the yeah. menu, you could you could spend a lot more time doing the content crafting on it, but in, in some ways it's the issues that you face are the same issues you face whereby um, you're building a CMS and you want it to evolve and change, but if you were to do that, then you would say no, no, you can't change that menu. That we've worked really hard to pick single words yeah. that we've translated <laughs> and they fit really nicely there, yeah. you know, and then you, you you lose that when you move to a, like a what what is a relatively inflexible uh, solution, at least in terms of content length anyway. Text expansion is about the same as those two particular languages. Yeah. Ooh, not when you get into longer phrases. Yeah. yeah. It's what? Is it an extra third longer? Is it or two thirds? What is it? Two thirds. Two thirds. Two thirds. Sixty percent longer. Sixty percent longer. So they, yeah, they yeah. kept. They, they they worked hard. You know, they they rather than saying they yeah, didn't say everything. Yeah. 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 Catch it, Rob. Make sure they're in Thursday night. Don't go home yeah, early. Absolutely. Yeah. Good yeah. job. We found we had difficulties importing the XML file afterwards. We never actually finished that part oh, yeah. because we'll of the paragraph. We we'll keep so that to ourselves. So, whether Lingo Tech uh, can support the paragraph modeling? We do. Is that on? Is this the cool. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for the yeah. questions. It's always good to get the first one to get the ball rolling. Yeah, we support it. Yeah. Yeah. No one wants to be first up sometimes. But no, that, 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 would be, be that was a. Right a right 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 right. Yeah, it's not part of it. The way it sounds like it was. Yeah, you can get it.